Now we consider the case of a synchronous machine. The synchronous machine in the stator, we have a three-phase balanced winding and we connect it to a three-phase balanced supply and we know from earlier in the series when we studied the rotating magnetic field, this will produce a field that is rotating at a synchronous speed ns in rivs per minute, which is equal to 60f over p, where this is pole pairs. So the arrangement will sketch would be like this, and I'm assuming the magnetic field is north and south, north and south, and so on. A linear sketch of this, just to give you an idea what I mean by the center, this line I'm drawing here, I'm assuming that the magnetic field over one electric cycle will be, uh, this is north and this is south, and this is the center of the pole. This is the center of the south and this is the center of the north. That's the meaning of this uh, sketch here. Let's delete that and having produced a magnetic field in the air gap that is rotating, I'll bring the rotor and the rotor carries north and south poles excited with DC. Now, if the rotating magnetic field is rotating at NS and the rotor is stationary, nothing will happen. But by some means, we will bring the rotor to rotate at the same synchronous speed as the field. This process is known as bringing the machine into synchronism. We synchronized the magnetic fields of the rotor with that of the stator. The axis of this south pole will be like this, the north pole will be like this. The, a unidirectional torque, because there will be a coupling, you can visualize it. If a south pole is near a north pole, they will align. And because they are moving at the same speed, because they are rotating at the same synchronous speed, they are stationary with respect to each other. It's like you are driving your car at 50 kilometers per hour and next to a railway line and you see a train moving at the same speed, the train will appear to be stationary with, from your reference frame. And the reference frame is a terminology we'll use later. Anyway, so when the rotor is brought into synchronism, by that it started rotating at the synchronous speed, uh, the tendency will be for this south pole to align itself with the north pole and there will be no angle between the two. Now we start applying a mechanical torque on the rotor, trying to reduce the speed of the rotor. It's not going to immediately, but the angle will start increasing. But the main point is when the machine is synchronized, no relative motion between the magnetic axes and an angle delta exists. If there is no load applied and there are no losses, angle delta will be zero. That this pole will align itself completely with this north pole. As the torque increases, as the load in the machine is increased, angle delta will increase. Up to a point and if it starts increasing, then this position of the rotor will become here. And of course the north, this part will also move there. So the angle will increase when it reaches 90 degrees electrical degrees. The coupling between the south pole and the north pole of the stator will be lost and we say synchronism will be lost. So again torque in a synchronous machine is produced due to interaction between the state of magnetic field, which we created a special magnetic field that is rotating at the synchronous speed, and the rotor, which is excited with DC, the uh, angle between them will keep increasing as the load is increased until it reaches 90 degrees, and 90 degrees is the maximum coupling. Beyond that, synchronism will be lost. Next, we consider the case of production of torque in an induction machine. And I just want to remind you of what I mean by induction. Induction, if I have a, a winding arrangement as shown 
axes and dots, then the flux pattern will be something like what's shown. Now, if I bring a member that is not magnetized at all, this inner member is not magnetized at all, and I place it in this magnetic field, there will have magnetic field out of this surface and into this surface, let's take it out. So this body now will be magnetized by induction. This is similar to the case, if you remember, when we have a coil, which is excited by current I, it will produce flux and the flux lines will do something like this. If I bring another coil that's not excited, that coil cuts the sum of the flux lines, there is coupling between them, and uh, if this flux is changing, there will be EMF induced here, i.e. we can magnetize this coil without the coil itself having any current, and that's the concept of induction. So, here we know that the inner member, this part, when we placed it in there, it was magnetized, it became magnetized, and it became magnetized with exactly the number of poles. If this has P pole pairs, this will also will have number of pole pairs or poles will be the same. This is just a reminder of what does in concept magnetic induction means. We look at the induction machine. The state of the induction machine is like that of the synchronous machine. Three-phase balanced winding uh, connected to a three-phase balanced supply, and that will give us rotating magnetic field, rotating with a speed ns equal 60f over p, that's Paul pairs. Look at, that's the flux rotating magnetic field. Now I bring the stationary rotor, put it there. This rotor is not actually exactly like this. It's conductors shown here in air. In reality, they will be housed in slots cut in an iron core. Why iron core? Because from our studies of magnetic circuits, we know that uh, iron has very high uh, relative permeability and the reluctance provided by the iron core is much lower than that of the air gap. So I'm just taking these conductors out of the iron core to illustrate the operation of the uh, induction machine. When the rotor is stationary, and this flux is rotating, then there will be a relative speed between the stationary rotor conductors and the flux which is rotating at the constant synchronous speed. This relative speed will be maximum because the rotor is speed is nr is zero, nr ns minus nr is ns, and the EMF will be introduced, if you remember, specific application of uh, Faraday's law, uh, they found that EMF equals BLV. Here we will ensure that B, L, and V are perpendicular to each other. And of course, this E induced in the rotor will be maximum. Why? Because the relative speed when the rotor is stationary at starting is maximum. So the current also will be maximum. Why current? Because these conductors are connected with this end rings. This is also conducting end ring. And we get the current like that. Of course, this current will continue like that and to go like that, for example. And similarly in the end winding. So that's the advantage of the end winding, closes the circuit. So we have current, rotor is still stationary these currents will be introduced in it. That what is the frequency of these currents? It's stationary rotor, the magnetic field is rotating at NS, so the frequency will be of the rotor at starting will be exactly the same of the stator. But now we have a situation that there is still the rotating magnetic field phi, and this now is current I, phi also has B. You remember the equation? F equals 
BLI, force produced uh, by interaction of flux density and the current carrying conductor. Now we apply this. So force will be produced and rotor currents interact so with the stratomagnetic field produce the force the rotor will start to rotate as the rotor starts to rotate in the same direction as the magnetic field nr this flux was rotating at ns the same direction then the relative speed will be reduced the emf induced in the rotor will be reduced because the emf is function of the relative speed if e is reduced i will also go down if i goes down then the force and the torque will go down so what we see here that the current will go down as nr is non-zero non-zero but not equal to ns let's look at a hypothetical situation that this torque produced and the force BLI accelerate the rotor until NR equals NS. If NR equals NS, what happened? There is no relative speed between the state or magnetic field and the rotor. So there will be no EMF, no current, no force. As soon as there is no force and torque, rotor speed will go down because of the inertia of the rotor and the friction in the bearings and as soon as the rotor speed nr starts to go below ns there will be relative speed emf in the rotor current in the rotor force and torque that torque again accelerates the rotor in fact we get a situation that the rotor current will go to zero then will go back to this in reality it doesn't the rotor currents will operate at a steady state at a speed nr is slightly less than ns so you know now why induction machines can never operate at ns why because in the hypothetical situation if they can then there will be no emf no current and no torque produced. How does that relate to the uh, load angle, which I discussed in the case of the DC and the synchronous machine? If you look at this current I, the red and the uh, blue currents of the rotor, you appreciate that by induction of this flux, there will be current and these currents have magnetic field so the rotor will have a magnetic field and i expect you to remember that if we have the magnetic uh, the magnetomotive force of the stator fs producing flux faraday's law e is d lambda by dt and when we applied this to a sinusoidal waveform we found that if the flux was a sine then the E was a cosine, i.e. there is a 90 degrees relation, electrical degrees relationship between the field and the EMF. So if this is Fs is the stator magnetomotive force, the EMF induced in the rotor is ER, EMF in the rotor. This EMF in the uh, rotor will produce current. The current is IR is ER over ZR. The ZR has two components, L and R, RR. L, XL is omega L. Omega is two pi F. So at starting, at starting the rotor frequency is equal to the stator frequency so it's maximum so omega l at starting over r is large let me just delete this so at starting omega l over r is large why because the rotor frequency is equal to the is that of the stator so we end up with ir which is really out of phase this is the power factor angle 
if r was zero if r was zero which is never is then th this i r will be in the same direction as f s but it's never is the magnetomotive force produced in the rotor due to this current i r is in the same direction as the current f r you can see now the angle this is the angle between the two mmfs it's small and again if r was ignored then you will get their both magnetomotive forces are in the same direction and we know if the two mmfs have are in the same direction no angle between them then there will be no torque produced at all in fact in this situation there is only enough load angle to produce torque that overcomes the losses in the machine now as the rotor starts to accelerate as the rotor starts to accelerate the relative speed between the rotating field and the rotor will go down and the rotor frequency will start going down if the rotor frequency starts to go down the re relation between omega l and r will start to uh, go down so it will become smaller as it becomes smaller the power factor angle here will change let's look at this situation now it's fs e in the magnitude of the current and e of course e here is smaller than this e why because it's proportional to the relative speed relative speed is lower now then this is r you can see the resistive effect is more pronounced than the inductive effect of the rotor this rotor has magnetomotive force in its direction you can see now the angle between the two is increasing so as the induction motor starts to rotate at various speeds various speeds means various frequencies the frequency of the rotor will change as the frequency of the rotor changes the ratio omega l over r in the rotor will change this power factor angle will change and as the power factor angle changes delta the load angle changes so although it's not very obvious induction machines also have a load angle and torque is produced via interaction between the stator rotating magnetic field and the rotor induced magnetic field so summary of these points induced rotor induced emf frequency and the current change with rotor speed and their maxima occur at standstill rotor emf and the load angle change you can see the emf magnitude changed and also the road angle load angle changed if e changes then you can see here that the magnitude of the brown rotor current has changed the torque produced is function of two things this product multiplied by sine delta but this fr is also a function of the current ir so the electromagnetic torque developed is pr proportional to the just multiply the magnitude sine delta both fr and delta change with rotor frequency or rotor speed we know now for every rotor speed there is a rotor frequency therefore there is a maximum there is a speed at which the maximum torque occurs in fact when we study induction motors in details all what i'm doing now is just introduce this is the starter the main menu is coming if you look at the torque as function of the speed and r you will find that the torque will do something like that and this maximum value of the torque occurs at certain speed for a given machine this certain speed you will find rate later that it's function of rr over xr this xr is omega l r so we know before we study anything about induction machines that there is a speed at which the torque is maximum and we also know that the frequency of the electrical quantities in the rotor are function of the speed that concludes the uh, introduction to electrical machines fundamentals shortly there will be uh, online the recordings and the lectures dealing with specific type of machines so i look forward to seeing you then